alignment that would be giving based on the scripture from verses one to four. And this challenges us to examine our motive and to give with a pure heart, seeking God's approval rather than the praise of man. The second segment will be dealing with the praise based on verses 5 to 14. Here Jesus instructs us to pray with sincerity, focusing on a personal relationship uh, with our God. He also provides a model for the prayer, commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. This passage, this passage does not only instruct us on the how, but also on the why of giving and praying. It calls us to cultivate a genuine spiritual life, characterized by humility, dissuasion, and a deep connection with our God. As we explore these verses today, let us open our hearts to the transformative power of these teachings and seek to apply them in our daily walk with Christ. May the Holy Spirit guide us as we reflect on this timely truth and strive to live out our faith with authenticity and devotion. Now let us first dive into the message that we can gain from the verses 1 to 4. Jesus teaches us about the nature of generosity. How should we approach the act of giving, revealing not just the action itself, but the heart behind it. In other words, how to practice a generous giving in a manner that's pleasing to God. As we reflect on these verses, let us open our heart to understand the true essence of generosity in the eye of the Lord. Jesus begins addressing the art of giving to the needy. He says, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the street, and be honored by others. Here, Jesus is not condemning the act of giving, but the manner in which it is done. Jesus calls out as hypocrisy. The hypocrite give publicly and ostentatiously try to gain recognition and praise uh, from the people. The heart of generosity is not the recognition that we see, but also about the compassion we feel. True, gener true generosity stems from love, from a genuine desire to help those in need. This is a wrong motive of giving. Jesus gave on a stark warning. Do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do. In the time of Jesus, it was common for some people to make a skill for their gener generosity. They wanted to be seen. They wanted to be praised by others. So their giving was not solely about helping the poor or, or, or helping the other people, but about seeking honor and recognition for themselves. How often do we see similar behavior today, whether it is through social media or posts or public acknowledgement or other means? The temptation to seek praise and admiration for our good deeds can be strong and can be very tempting. Jesus' words remind us that such emotives are misplaced. The true generosity seeks no earthly recognition, but will be written, remembered, will be acknowledged, will be rewarded in heaven. Jesus continues to say, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Those who give for the sake of public acknowledgement have already received their reward. Can we say the fleeting reward, the fleeting praise of, 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 of others? And this is shallow. This is a kind of temporary reward. 
compared to the eternal reward God offers. When our motive of giving is to seek human approval, yes, we will be missing out on the greater rewards that come from our God. Our giving should be motivated by selflessness and a desire to serve God perfectly. Seems to be it's not moving. I don't know. In contrast, Jesus entrusts us to give in secrecy. Say he saying, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. The vivid imagery illustrates the importance of humility and discretion in our acts of generosity. Secret, secret, secret giving can be said as a profound expression of our humility and the trust that we have in God. It shows that we are not seeking validation from others, but are confident that God recognizes our need. Jesus assures us that your Father who see what is done in secret will reward you. Unlike human recognition, which is fleeting, which is superficial, and also not fulfilling, is to be a divine reward in, in contrast, or God's reward is an eternal, a deeply fulfilling, and it is the reward that touches the soul and brings true joy and peace to our lives. God rewards is not necessarily material wealth or earthly recognition of success. It is the inner satisfaction knowing that we are doing God's will. A deep joy that comes from the helping others and the eternal treasure that we install in heaven. In the Bible, there are many instances of anonymous giving or acts of kindness without seeking recognition or highlight. And here I uh, have a few examples that I list here. In the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan helped a wounded man by providing medical care and also paying for his lodging without seeking any reward or recognition. His identity is not revealed. This incident was recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 25 to 27. The other one is a boy with a five small loaves of barley bread and two small fish. This event is also recorded in all four gospels. The identity of this boy is not mentioned. I'm sure you remember the alabaster jar that was recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 7, from 37 to 38. A sinful woman anointed Jesus' feet with an expensive alabaster jar of perfume. Though her act of generosity, her act of re repentance is noted, but her name remains anonymous. The essence of this teaching is that our giving should come from a pure heart, motivated by love and compassion, and not by the desire for accolades. When we give quietly, when we give sincerely, we align our heart with God's heart, who sees the value and value of our intention. They are practice say that we can cultivate the, this generous giving. One is by expanding your motives. Well, we have to regularly reflect on why you give, you know. Why I do? Are we seeking a recognition or are we driven by a genuine compassion? Second, we can give analysis wherever possible in a, a skip in a way that do not draw attention to others. This could be through anonymous donation, 
for simply keeping your ads of kind of kind of private. Number three, cultivate a heart of generosity. We can pray for Heavenly Father for a heart that seek no uh, love for uh, recognition and also seek to give out of love and compassion. Ask that to help you to see the needs around you and respond selflessly. Number four, you can trust in God's reward. Focus on the eternal reward God promises rather than seeking immediate earthly recognition. Let us at this moment just move to move to the uh, second part of our uh, uh, yeah, Okay, maybe I'll just uh, give a conclusion of this one for this first part. You know. As we reflect on these verses from Matthew 6, 2 to 4, let us examine our own hearts and the motive in our act and before given. Are we seeking the human trait or are we giving out of love and compassion, trusting that God sees in our hearts? True generosity is not about the amount we give. All recognition we receive, but about the love and humility that with which we give. Let us pray for the grace to give selflessly in humility humble, and humbly, knowing that our Father in heaven sees our actions and we reward us according to the divine will. May our generosity reflect the love of Christ and bring glory to our God alone. Well, let us move to the second segment of the morning, this morning message. In the book of Matthew chapter 6, 5 to 14, Jesus addresses the second key aspect of Christian life. And that is prayer. His words challenge us to reflect on the authenticity of our faith and our motivation behind our action. The essence of prayer in this fast piece of word, filled with complexities and distractions, it is very easy for us to be to feel overwhelmed even in our spiritual practices. But it has been said that prayer is the heartbeat of the Christian life. It connects us with God and strengthens our faith. Martin Luther once said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Prayer has always been the priority among other religions, our Christian religious practice. The essence of prayer lies not on elaborate words or grand gestures, but in the genuine heartfelt communication between you and God. Just as with giving, our prayer should be directed towards God and not towards increasing, increasing other people. Reverend Charles Spurgeon is a 19th, 19th century work, prominent evangelist, once said, True prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It's, it is a far deeper than that. He said, It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. Whoa, what an honor and what a privilege. 
in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 to verse 8, also Peter praying in sincerity and with privacy. Jesus often emphasizes the importance of praying in sincerity and with a, a privacy. And so you remember the the, uh, the parable, considering the parable that was written uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 18, from verse 9 to verse 14. The, the Pharisee and the tax collector, I'm sure you're familiar with this, uh, uh, this parable. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. He said, God, I gave you, I thank you that I'm not like other people, rather, evildoers. Adultery, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. In contrast to this tax collector, he stood at a distance. He would not even took a look into the heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus concluded with his parable, saying, I tell you that this man, rather than that the other, went home justified before God. This story teaches us that God honors humble and sincere heart over self righteousness and ostentation. His prayer is, is elaborate but lacks sincerity. On the other hand, the tax collector's prayer is simple and humble. He recognizes his sin and earnestly asks for God's mercy. He, as I say, she tells us that any tax collector who goes home justifies before God. A true prayer is an intimate conversation with God, not a performance of poor others, not a showcase for your piety. Just think about a girl who shares her dreams, her worries with her parents in a quiet personal conversation. And it is this private moment that the deepest bonds are formed. Likewise, our prayers should be heartfelt and personal, shared in a quiet space with our Heavenly Father. Dear Jesus, Teaches that prayer is an intimate conversation with God, not a public performance. This emphasis of praying in private underlines the personal relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father, where our focus is solely on God. It is not the eloquence or the length of our prayers that matters, but the sincerity and the faith behind them. It has been said and well said. In prayer, it is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. How often do we get caught up in this type of formality of prayer? Perhaps worrying about uh, 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 more about uh, uh, how we sound than what we are trying to express ourselves to God. Jesus encouraged us to keep it simple and sincere, trusting that God already knows our need. The key aspect of prayer that Jesus has highlighted, I think there is some of the three points. One is the sincerity. Jesus condemns the prayers of hypocrites who pray to be seen, be heard, and be praised by others. Jesus also referred to this simple simplicity. This is warned again the use of many words or many empty phrases that here are not because of our length of the our prayer, but because of our sincerity. And then the faith and trust. Jesus assumes and also assures us that our Father knows what we need before we ask Him. This encouraging us to trust in God's provision and his care. 
how can we apply all these lessons to our life? Here are a few practical points. Number one, speak from your heart. When you pray, just pray whatever is in your heart. That you, the, your words should come from a place of honesty, even though it's vulnerability as well. Share your true thoughts and feelings with him. Second, keep it simple. Don't worry about finding the right words to say or making a clear lengthy. Focus on the essence of what you want to communicate with our God who is in heaven. Number three, be humble. Approach God with a humble spirit. Acknowledge your dependence on his grace and mercy. Just like this tax collector. Then number four, trust in God's understanding. Remember that God knows your need even before you speak. Trust in his wisdom and his love. And Jesus, for his ending that uh, in his uh, teaching, he said, This then is how you should pray. And Jesus provides a perfect model for our prayers, commonly known as the Lord's Prayer, which encapsulates the essence, essence of what our prayer should be. It starts with honoring. And adoring God. In other words, it with reverence. It is here says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then it follows with acknowledgement of God's sovereignty, submission to God's will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then you seek for his provision. Not the dependence of God. The Lord's prayer says, Give us today our daily bread. Then ask for forgiveness and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And then lastly, request for his guidance and protection. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The whole Lord's prayer is a little more than one minute. But it encapsulates all the essential in that prayer. I can give you an illustration. The Lord is just like a blueprint. Consider a blueprint for a house. While each house built on a blueprint may look a little bit different, but the essential structure remains the same. So the Lord's prayer is a blueprint for our prayer, guiding us of how to align our heart with God's will. Here, probably, I would like to just uh, maybe tell you a story about about uh, uh, Charles. Uh, his person, you know, about his generosity and forget uh, about himself. I think I don't get that. Uh, and, It was very moving what he did. And he was an evangelist, a very prominent evangelist, and he has been uh, uh, very successful in his ministry. He was born in 1934 uh, and died in 19, uh, not 1834 and 1892. And he spent around 58 years. He kind of shaped the earth, the world of his uh, with his uh, uh, amazing. But this was a kind of a, a five minute kind of a, a incident that, that happened to him.
Well, this was a, I, I don't think it's just a, a, a story, but uh, this was a, a, a rebel's uh, pursuit. Uh, he was uh, trying to 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 count which one for his uh, orphan. He had orphans also, but smaller scale than George Muir. So he went to, to Bristol, England, where uh, uh, George Muir is his uh, orphanage. He went there for an evangelical community, and he was trying to collect around 300 pounds, English pounds. So in one week of evangelical uh, 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 meeting, indeed, like a soul, soul to be saved, and life changed. And at the same time, his uh, financial goal was reached also with a uh, 300 pounds. And that evening when he was bowing and saying a, a, a praise to God, and he had a, a kind of a, a spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit come moving his heart. He wants uh, Spurgeon to give this sum of money to his heart, to, to be the other for, for, for labor, it, uh, George Miller. Um, and he said, Lord, I can do that because I do need this sum of money to help my orphan, uh, my orphanage. But again, he did have a peace in his heart. So he started to kneel down and, and, and uh, uh, submit to that uh, uh, spirit, Holy Spirit of uh, movement. So the next day, he left his feet and, going, and went to, to the uh, 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 Reverend uh, George Mueller, uh, Mueller uh, uh, orphan. When he went there, he saw uh, this service of God was on his knee. Pray. So, Reverend Charles Spurgeon put his hand on the shoulder of, of this, uh, um, of the, of the, of the uh, Spurgeon put his hand on the shoulder of that, George and told him, he said, George, I got a send me to give me some of money, this 300 pounds. And it's amazing, uh, George, he was kind of sad, saying, I was just praying that God that I need three pounds uh, both of this God's labor. They would uh, God uh, certainly they were very happy and they would come away also at the same time. He could and he grow it uh, And that to show that she really took part with the money that he need, need most uh, for this orphanage in order to help another uh, person uh, for the orphan. And also talk about the uh, uh, the efficacy, efficacy of the trade. Both of these giants, these evangelists, there are tons of uh, testimony that they can share with us at the market. That kind of there is a, a, an anecdote, a piece in story about George Miller in our city county. George Miller, he has a big, he not only evangelist, he's the director of the so called Aston Down uh, uh, Orphanage in Bristol, uh, England. And he has also kind of a, a two care, it is like two care of more than 10,000 orphans and it gives them not only lives and also the education. But he never asked for donation, asked people or tell his needs to the public. He was confined to God and he firmly believed God will provide. And he did. All these 50 years of his uh, labor of his work, he never has any deficit. You know, God has blessed him. And this was just one of the animals of that Charles Spurgeon, who himself is a very common evangelist, who himself has also offered it that he also needs funds to try to transport, but he is the type of a spirit, a spirit that moves him to part of that money and give it to a George Mueller. It's kind of touching uh, story. Then when you look at the follow up, when we go to this uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 14, uh, then there's Jesus concludes his uh, 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 teaching by even adding one more statement. Say, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So in other words, it's set to pay for forgiveness. Jesus concludes this section by emphasizing the necessity or necessity of forgiveness. Our ability to forgive others is intrinsically linked to God's forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness is not optional. It is the vital component of our relationship with God and with others. Um, 
before I come to conclusions, uh, I try to uh, share with you maybe a, a, a story about uh, George Miller. George Miller was a Christian evangelist and the director of the Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England during the 19th century. He is a renowned for his deep faith and reliance on prayer to meet the need of the orphans under his care. He has chronicled or record almost 50,000 of ancient prayers in his diary, in his journal. So if you look at his uh, life, it's full of miracles because of his fervent prayer in front of God. We rely on prayer all. And one of the famous ones is this one. That one morning, the orphanage was completely out of food. There was no breakfast for the children. In spite of this dire situation, Miller instructed all the children to sit down at the dining table as usual. He then prayed. He said, thank you, God, for the food they were about to receive, even though there was nothing on sight inside. Remarkably, soon after Miller finished his praying, there was a knock on the door. It was a local baker. And he informed Mueller that he had been unable to sleep the previous night, feeling strongly that the orphanage needed bread. So he got up and baked fresh bread for the children. Shortly after the baker left, there was another knock on the door. And this time it was a milkman. And his cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage. And he needed to lighten his load in order to repair the wheel. So he offered the orphanage fresh milk, which provided children with a morning meal. These have stories often cited to be a powerful example of Mueller's faith and his trade, the second trade of God's provision. I say he never made his needs known to people, relying solely on trade to communicate with God. Trusting that God would move people's heart to meet the needs of the orphanage. This instance of Baker and the milkman is one of the many such instances recorded in Mueller's journey. He demonstrating his unwavering faith, his prayers, powerful prayers that the God is answered. And uh, as I say, as I say, he has uh, uh, he, there, I have a, 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 a article to say about yes, the unfailing, unfailing uh, type of a uh, answer from from God uh, in his request. And uh, as I say, he has uh, written almost six thousand of those uh, testimonies of those. Uh, 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 encounters that get with God that God has provided to you. So just like let, let, just to sum up the, for, for, for this good segment, you know. So our, at, at, uh, at the conclusion for this uh, two area, as we go forward from here, uh, let us strive to embody this teaching in our daily life. May we our giving be marked by generosity and compassion, free from the desire of recognition. May our prayers be earnest and humble, seeking not our own will, but the will of our Father who is in heaven. Let us, let us remember that in all we do, we are called to reflect the love and the grace of God. By aligning our actions, with the teaching of Jesus, our action, align our action with God's will. We can draw closer to God, become the beacon of His light in the world. So,
as we continue to give and to pray. Let us do so with the hearts fully devoted to God. Confident that He sees and knows whatever need and will, will reward us according to His perfect will. Let's go ahead and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that guides us in our daily work. Help us to give with generous heart, seeking only to honor you. Teach us to pray with sincerity, focusing on our relationship with you rather than on the approval of others. Grant us the grace to forgive those who have wronged us as you have forgiven us our sin. May our life be a reflection of your love and you do great. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.